this computer. So the session will be recorded and at that same URL that you uh, registered, found the materials at on the, Cal the California Technical, no, wrong, wrong website, on the CPC website, you'll be able to also in a day or so get a copy of this recording if you want to take a look at it. Our objectives for today is really we're going to start with, since it's SEL, self-care first. How are we making sure that we're taking care of ourselves um, during this really disruptive um, time? We're also going to be taking a look at SEL and the PBIS framework. How those two go together, where they cross over in implementation, and how we use explicit teaching in the work we're doing when we're developing SEL with our kids. Um, we're going to look at the PBIS virtual classroom practices. So those basic classroom practices that are our foundations, our prevention practices, and our response practices also fit in the virtual classroom. And how do we make that, that transfer? And we're really going to be looking at the foundations because that's the piece that the SEL connects in really well. Um, we're also going to be taking a look at SEL virtual student projects. So what are some things that you can be doing with your kids now that help them develop their insights, help with self-regulation, and develop cooperation? We're going to make sure we're following our expectations online. We're going to be respectful. So um, that's keeping yourselves on mute and then using the chat box uh, to talk with each other and ask questions. Christy's monitoring it. So she'll be able to answer any questions that come up along the way. And then we also want to make sure that we're safe. So we're using our physical distancing by making use of the Zoom in order to communicate with each other. And we are going to be responsible um, by using our be requested behaviors in the breakout room, being able to introduce ourselves to each other and have a good conversation, participate. When you get asked to join a breakout room, please join it jump in there and have a conversation. If you haven't done those before, they're fun and take a risk. So first I have to say it's, wait a minute, Barb, can you see it? It's my turn. So I appreciate, I appreciate um, the chats that are going on that just talk about great examples of SEL and distance learning that, that Barb and I are having this uh, challenge. Um, and then we did try our cell phones. Somebody suggested that. So please keep bringing in those suggestions. Um, I'm going to try this like my turn thing. Not yet. Um, we haven't practiced that. It's kind of a routine that we're going to have to practice. But what we're going to do is check in. Um, check in is a way of self-care. So if we're not checking in with ourselves, we start the day and we just go through the day and things come up and we just don't know why we react the way we do sometimes to things. I mean, in the morning, I like to check in and I don't know about you guys, but I've been so used to just jumping out of bed, getting ready to work, going through my day and not having that opportunity to actually go from head to toe and check in physically how I'm feeling, emotionally how I might be feeling, even mentally how I'm feeling. Just scanning myself to find that calming effect. Just doing that kind of helps me start my day. So I love this quote about emotions are like weather patterns. We can't control them, but we can wear the proper attire. Like when it rains, we can put on a raincoat. So I like to say, like, what do we do to pull into our resiliency toolkit to help us when we've identified maybe an emotion or feeling that's been going on? So there today, lots of different weather. I'm out in Arizona where it's very sunny right now, but that not, may not be how I'm feeling. So in the chat box, we just kind of invite you to check in with how you're feeling based on your own personal weather report right now. So is it sunny and bright for you? Are you feeling kind of monsoon-like, raining and thunderstorms? Maybe cloudy with the sun peeking through? Windy, blustery, lots of different choices. Clear, you're fresh, you're clean, maybe cold and frigid and blizzard-like. So just share as a group and we can get a sense of the different weather patterns that are coming our way. We've got lots of sunny, I like that cloudy, partly cloudy with occasional strong breezes. Yeah, I've lived that life one day. 
occasional windy bursts, beautiful blue skies, breezy, partly cloudy. I do have to say that this is a repeat webinar. We did it last month, early in the month. And I'm going to say if we were collecting data on weather, it was far more blustery and thundery and rainy than it is right now for everybody. Flash flooding. Oh, that's going on. I love flash flooding. Okay. Yeah. Get a sense, though, that maybe the weather is kind of clearing up for some of us as we've been going through this and trying to figure it out. So, all right. I'm going to hold up my sign for Barb. I'm going to tell her to turn. That's the slide. She's going to click it, maybe. There she goes. All right. So self care first, there's a great website out of Midwest PBIS. And there's a whole slew of self care strategies for us as educators. We have to remember it's about us first. Um, checking in like we just did is a self care strategy. We need to be really effective with our kids. We need to be compassionate. We need to be receptive to the emotions that they may be going through, especially right now. And we're going to really relate to what we already know. And now during this time, um, where we are and where we're going to go in the future with um, our kids in school. So how do you build your energy, your focus, your resiliency now during this time of high demand? And how are you balancing out the weight and stress of being an educator during these trying times? So what do you do to help manage your stress? So we're going to create our own self-care first little booklet for all of us, our little community of practice. And we're going to use the chat box. And then what we do is we download all the strategies that you're going to give us that help you. So can you just put it in the chat box and then we're going to reorganize that and then that'll be a resource that you can go to in the future to pull to see what everybody has said. I'm not going to read them um, because you'll have the opportunity to go back and maybe um, pick something new that you haven't thought about. So I'll give you a few more minutes. Love that. <laughs> and whoever put wine, I've been there. I like it. Has anybody done the virtual wine tasting? That's been a really good self-care for me. Spinning, yeah. And laying on the couch is perfect. Giving ourselves permission that that is self-care just to reflect and be quiet, yeah. So I didn't, she did a great job. She turned the slide for me. Um, social emotional learning is what we're gonna be talking about in this. Um, short webinar, but we really always want to integrate and align social emotional learning with PBIS. This is PBIS and we don't want to think of separate initiatives. We always want to think what are we doing in our PBIS practices and systems that really align with what we know about social emotional core competencies. So let's all start with the same definition for social emotional competency. Um, it's a process through which we can apply the knowledge and attitudes and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions that are essential to academic and pro-social success. We know that a positive learning environment, positive school climate, PBIS, is one that is perceived as predictable, consistent, inclusive, and most importantly, perceived by staff and students as emotionally and physically safe. So how are we combining these things? We know that the competencies, and you can see the wheel, it comes from the castle work. We start with the orange, we start with ourselves. So what are we doing in our PBIS work that helps students and adults be aware and manage their emotions? How do we understand them? How do we manage them and think about how our behavior might affect others? Those are the insights. We're going to talk about insights later on. If you go to the green, it's really about then how we're operating with our emotions and thinking of others. So stepping outside ourselves. How do we understand what others might be going through? How do we integrate? interact with others and how do we regulate our reactions to others that's when we really talk about self-regulation we can't get to self-regulation 
aren't aware of that. And we all want to have, as an adult, and with the students we work with, responsible decision makers. I mean, that's where we, you know, kids get in trouble and you're like, what were you thinking, you know? How did you decide to do that? If we do realize that we've got to always be providing opportunities for self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship building, to get to that idea that kids can work together, kids can be by themselves and make the right decision. So that's the last really that has to happen. I'm gonna go like this. I'm gonna do my sign, the barb. Okay. So before we can problem solve and make decisions, we must learn to control our emotions and impulses. So we really divided these up into three digestible ways to understand our work and when we're working with our kids um, and when we're working with our PBIS practices. Are we giving our students the opportunity to build insight? Are we building opportunities and practice opportunities for kids and adults to regulate? And finally, we have cooperative learning groups, but are we really with an intention of building that understanding of how we work with each other? And what do we do using our school-wide expectations, our values? Do we have the opportunity to teach our kids to have them be able to self-monitor and use those practices outside of you being the one to always tell them that they're, they're either doing it or not? It's my new behavior. So I think it's my turn now. Um, when we take a look at this slide, this is a great um, resource for you to listen to Kelly Perales. And the uh, URL is there at the bottom of the slide. You probably can't see it really well here, but you will when you download the slides. And she really talks about um, how social emotional learning really needs to be deliberate, that we need to have explicit teaching in order to um, have the kids learn those skills, those coping strategies, those emotional regulations, all that Christy was just now talking about with you. And she also talks about how all kids need some explicit instruction in one way or another. And so this is where it brings into our multi-tiered systems of support. Somewhere along the continuum, all kids need some support and some skill development in this area. Um, she talks about particularly now, it was really meaningful. Um, this was before the COVID experience, um, this conversation, but she talks about that you might have at one school setting or in one context or before we all went on distance learning till now, and that you have students that need a tier two or tier three type of an intervention um, for one of these social emotional skills. Yet at another school, you might find when you look at your data at your school site, that you might have a tier two type of intervention that you're doing at a tier one level for everybody. So she talks about how important it is that we take a look at doing some screening to decide what we need, what's really important, what we need to teach and what levels we need to teach that at. And so it's just a really good reminder that what we left school with, what we, when we left school, what we thought kids needed, what type of support might be completely different now um, when they're coming back. So it's a, it's a really good um, YouTube uh, video to watch and an article that goes with that. So highly recommend you check on her. And then Christy wants to say something. That I just put the link in the chat box for the video. I gave you all the links of all the resources earlier, but I just pulled this one out for those of you that just want to see the one link. And the rest of the links are all <laughs> And when we're talking about making sure we have explicit instruction, we're looking at teaching those social emotional competencies within our framework, not something that happens outside of what we're already doing. So this is a great um, brief that's on the um, pbs.org website that you would be able to read. Recommend again, you take a look at that, but they're really talking about how once our school, once your school decides what important social emotional competencies you need, what your needs are for your students, then it's how do you specifically lay that into your school-wide teaching matrix, into your classroom teaching matrix, now into our online 
um, teaching matrix into the teaching matrices that are at home. So we're gonna talk about how do you embed that and use what we're already doing with what we know with the principles of PBIS in order to teach these social emotional skills. Here's an example of a um, matrix for a school. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this out of the way because I like one of the examples that was over here. So it's got online um, as one of the environments. And you can see one of the ideas under respect is consider feelings of others before I post. So that's really about self-awareness. So the idea is that those are good skills that we wanna teach kids, but let's be thoughtful about which one of those SEL core competencies are we really tackling? And is, are we in our matrices covering those SEL competencies that we thought were really important? Where can we find them in our matrix and make sure we're, we're calling that out. Another example is under responsible in the hallways. It's about maintaining physical space. So again, now that's social awareness. So these are those precursors that we need to make sure all kids have a skill set to on a continuum because some kids are going to be better at it than others um, in order to get to where we want that responsible decision making. So be sure to include then and take a look at your existing classroom matrix. We're going to talk about your virtual classroom matrix as well. A reminder about the supporting and responding uh, to problem behavior document. Uh, it will cover for you those foundations of setting routines and expectations, which is really where we can embed our SEL, but it also helps you know how to use. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. What do we need to do in our prevention practices so that we're making use of our uh, teaching matrices with the SEL skill sets embedded in them? Before we do that, we want to give you the opportunity to be able to get into breakout rooms and have some conversations. So on the very last page of your handout, um, there is an example of a matrix. And the reason I'm bringing that up to you is that when I put you in the breakout rooms, you won't have any of these prompts anymore about what on earth are we supposed to be talking about in the breakout room. So the reminder is, you know, when you get to your breakout rooms, be sure to join when you get asked to be invited. Have someone take the natural lead. Uh, make sure you invite everybody in the room. Have a conversation then about what would those behavioral skills be that you want to show when you're being respectful and you feel upset or when you want to be respectful and you're having a problem what would be some of those ideas and just a reminder and this is a part that will go away for you um, that whenever you are setting up your behavioral expectations inside your matrix you want to make sure that it's observable that it's measurable that it's positively stated always applicable and that it's understandable so we don't have the kids with us today to make sure this is understandable. We're gonna be on our own. Uh, so we might end up with teacher language, but know that when you would do this with your kids, you would involve their language and, and make sure then that it's understandable for them in the context that they're in. So I'm going to um, take a moment and look at how many of us there are. There's 111 of us. So I'm gonna put us in breakout rooms of about eight people in each breakout room. Be sure to accept and we will spend about 15 minutes in the breakout room. So while I'm doing that, Christy will take over and keep talking because I can't hear if you have any problems. I guess that's my cue. So I'm just gonna ramble on now. Um, so if you have done breakout rooms with your own kids, um, you know that it's difficult to monitor what's going on so that would be something that I would really encourage if you have had the opportunity in the virtual classroom to do that. Okay, I'm going to create the rooms now. So you'll be getting some invitations in the breakout room as well.
Courtney, I think I see that you're not in a room. You wanna, oh, I can't hear you even if you do unmute. So you're not joined in a room. I will re-invite you to another room. Is there a link for me to get into the room? For anyone who might still be in the main room, and if you weren't with us at the very, very beginning, you may not know that I can't hear you. Somehow or another, I have unclipped some button and I can't hear. Everyone can hear me, but I can't hear anyone else. So yeah, I do have my chat box open. If you're stuck in the main room and I don't see it on my end, let me know um, in the chat box and then I can send you to one of the rooms where there's an opening.
anyone in the main room, there may be a few of you. Um, if you would like, we have about five or six more minutes. If you wanted to unmute yourselves and have a conversation with each other, I unfortunately won't be able to hear you. Um, I've asked a couple if you want to be changed to another room. I'm not sure why it's not working. So if you're here in the main room, um, go ahead and unmute yourselves and have a conversation with each other about what you would see and hear when you feel upset or when I have a problem. So if you've just joined us or you have dropped out of a breakout room and you're in the main room and you can hear me, know that we're gonna come back together as a group and move forward with the instruction on SEL in the classroom in just about three more minutes. I'll be bringing, closing all the breakout rooms and bringing everybody back to the main room. If you are in the main room, um, you can unmute yourselves and have a conversation if you want for the next couple of minutes, at least say hi um, to each other. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Okay, I think we should all be coming back into the main room by this point. And as usual, I have to stop sharing for a moment. And we'll be an opportunity to see each other while I um, close out the PowerPoint and come back on because it stops being able to progress through for some reason. I have no idea why. And back up we are. except I forgot to share my. Okay, here we go again. Share. You'd think by now I'd have the sequence down. Okay, here we go. All right, so you've had an opportunity to have some conversations about what we would see and hear when we add the context of one of those SEL ideas of when I feel upset or when I have a problem. We want to remind you that we also have in our prevention practices. So once we've done our routines and we've set up our matrix, we have to make sure that we're adding in um, active supervision. Again, one of the prevention practices. So how are we making sure that we're watching for kids doing these things that are in our matrix, particularly if you're thinking about your online experience. How are you watching for these um, behaviors from your students? Making sure that we're acknowledging those behaviors so we don't have to come up with something new. We spent time deciding what we would see in here within that matrix. So use that and make sure you're using the language of your virtual matrix for your virtual classroom. We also want to make sure that uh, we are um, using our prompts and our pre-corrects, that we are reminding kids about what it is that we're going to do when we feel upset, when we get ready to go into maybe a new assignment or we're switching gears or we're going into the, to the breakout rooms themselves and we have to, we might get upset because we can't get in or we can't hear. Well, how are we gonna behave and what's it gonna look like? So do those pre-corrects. The B Plus um, is a uh, great app. Uh, many of maybe you have already heard about that from our previous webinars. It is on the PBIS.org website. It's an app that you can download um, both for your uh, iPhones as well as Androids. And it helps you be able to keep track of how often you are giving those positive prompts and pre-corrects when you want to do that. And then make sure, of course, that we're using student engagement in order to make this happen. So I'm going to text Barb and tell her her volume. Did you guys all hear that? The matrix. We also have to be following those prevention practices. Okay, my turn. Um, so we talked about our foundations, which um, when we're talking about our PBIS practices that support our teachers in the classroom, um, the foundations being our school-wide expectations and routines and how we integrate SEL within that. Barb just gave you an example of how we look at our prevention practices. And then we also look at our response practices. And really that's responding to those minor misbehaviors or challenges within the classroom. And how does that really align with SEL work? So we want to remember that we have a continuum of practices and that continuum really of consequences for kids are proactive strategies, are instructive, and are restorative. And proactive is that example of maybe having um, behavior specific praise as part of your continuum. When a student misbehaves, you're gonna be giving behavior specific praise maybe to another student so that that student kind of will realign themselves. Instructive, we always want to um, respond to kids to say, wow, maybe they need more support. We didn't teach them that pro-social skill and we'll give them some more opportunities to build fluency of being respectful during transition time. And of course, restorative is looking at those restorative questions. Um, how do we get kids to be able to process maybe some of their consequence, um, their behavior? That goes back to the regulation piece and what they need to do um, to come back. And we can guide them with questions. We want to empower students and make sure that our responses is an opportunity to teach resiliency skills for those kids. So build up as many opportunities or fill their toolkit with those opportunities for them to come back. Um, so we talk about our own resiliency, 
our kids need that need need those opportunities as well. We want to replace learned responses with appropriate behavior. So we always want to remember the mantra: you want to teach what you want to see, right? So um, never forget that it's instructive and that it's uh, really about the appropriate behavior that we're instructing. And last but not least, I it. It's about helping students regulate their emotions. So that is what our continuum of response practices looks like. It's not the hammer and it's not punishment. It's providing them all of the opportunities for them to pull themselves back and to be part of the group and engaged again in learning. And as you can tell, there's um, Bart, no, that's that's uh, Homer and, and his wife. And, and they're they're learning some of those um, self-regulation strategies too. Oh yeah, she turned the page. All right, um, we actually talked about a little of this in our breakout rooms. Uh, we want to think about our response continuum um, as a way of adding co-regulation in discipline. So in the classroom, it's not about the student; it's about engaging with that student. I like the mantra that says a teacher's brain should resemble a thermostat rather than a thermometer when it comes to disciplining a student. So students can make good decisions if it's a calm brain. And to get them to have a calm brain, we need to be the catalyst to calm them back down. So there's a great article. There's It's on the handout that we gave you. It's by Utopia, and it's about the role of emotion um, co-regulation in discipline. So we s encourage everybody to really read that and to look at our role when it comes to disciplining kids and how we are regulating ourselves. We always say that you need to be in a Zen moment um, when you're addressing this behaviors in your classroom. And that is just so hard to do. We know that. And it takes a lot of practice. Um, so it's just another awareness piece that we need to look at to get our kids back focused, making good decisions and engaged. One of the things that we can do as adults, I love this. Um, it's really a resiliency skill or strategy. And that's um, that whole self-talk or our thought control. And so I don't know how many of you have had these upsetting thoughts that, especially at the beginning of the school year, right? She ruins everything. She is so exhausting. This is going to be the worst year of my career. Or I've been waiting. I've been hearing about her. I've been hearing from all of those third grade teachers and finally now she's in fourth grade and I get her. You know, so, you know, you're just wiping yourself off, getting all stressed off about having that student in your classroom where you can switch that right to these common thoughts of how wow, having her in my class is going to be wonderful. I am going to learn so much from her. It is going to be the most awesome year and I'm going to become the most awesome teacher because she's going to teach me so much. So just a, just a shift in that thought process. Um, you've been, been using calming thoughts during this whole time today that what a great opportunity to practice being able to do this with some kind of sign language to figure out how to move through this webinar today. Um, but we want to make sure too that we're really looking at how important and impactful it is for kids to gain their own insight into their own behavior into their own being. And that's really what these social emotional skill developments are allowing us to do. It really helps students building in their self-confidence, building their self-esteem, learning to have empathy for others. So there is a tremendous uh, benefit for us to pay attention to these SEL types of skills in our teaching matrices. And so when we're talking about some activities that we can do to help kids build insight, there's things like when we're talking about developing their own personal strength, where they can build personal collages and be able to do that as an assignment that's fun. They can build it with their um, parents. They could do it on their own. Personal collages work for all age levels. It's a great activity to do in high school as well. They can share their collages with each other. We can do that online. We can pass the, the um, screen around so that people can share what their collages look like and who they are. Um, things like acrostic poems, uh, finding your own personal strengths, activities where you can do that. What are the, there's the top 10 employers wish list. 
And that's really a good activity for high school kids um, because it lets them know, oh, I'm doing this because I'm gonna get employed. This is what an employer is looking for. It really adds meaning to what they're doing, understanding their strengths. You can do activities around um, emotional development by looking at uh, doing the checking in really important, something that we have learned in the last two months that is an important thing to do. We've even tried to incorporate it a tiny bit at each one of these webinars where we check in with each other and see how we're doing. It is really important. We have noticed when we've had our own um, meetings with our colleagues that when we don't do that, at the end of the meeting, it was sorely missed. Temperature checks are another way to do that. Um, talking about how you're feeling, using little face emojis. There were some of them on the very first slide where you could connect with how am I feeling today by looking at those pictures. And journaling, of course, of course is always a way. And then we wanna promote that emotional literacy. And we can do that like with vision boards where kids get magazines out or kids can draw pictures about where are they now? Where do they wanna be? Where do they wanna be a year from now? What will it look like in one more month when we come back to school? Um, they can do heart maps. And then one of the activities that we've had fun with for all age levels, and I'll give you a high school example, is called a four square approach. And what we did with the motions um, was to take one word and the word was afraid. And we asked the kids then to write down um, five synonyms to that word. And they did it on big chart paper. And every group of kids had a different word that they were working on and they wrote down those five words. And the next thing they did was look in magazines and cut out pictures about um, that word. What was it that represents that word afraid in pictures or they could draw pictures. Then the third thing was to have them um, talk about what would be a, um, a movie um, that you would see that in where have you seen that or, or an event that would evoke that feeling and then the fourth one was like songs or movies so by the time they were done they had really had a good discussion about where we see it happening and reached good agreement and then at the very end went around the room and had each person um, present their posters but without the word afraid on top because that was this this group's um, challenge and everybody had to guess what the word was. And right on, everybody guessed what the word is. It was lots of fun. I actually did this activity with a group of high school teachers and they immediately saw the value of taking it back and using it in their high school classrooms. Um, a lot of it was in their, uh, a lot of English second language students. They had trouble with identifying emotions, but then they had a conversation that they had so much fun with it as an adult, they would, we're pretty sure that their kids would enjoy the activity as well. So Barb uh, was telling you some activities um, about insight, and that would be something to consider maybe during this virtual learning time, distance learning, um, that we can provide those kind of group activities. It's so important for our kids um, when they're learning about themselves to also be learning about others. So why not have these as assignments and then report back as a group? Uh, all the activities that we're giving you for insight, for regulation, and for cooperation is found in the handout. So there are descriptions and examples of what those are. And these are just some things that we pulled together. Um, and always remember to tie in your school-wide expectations or values or the language that you have established with your class, the pro-social language, that we don't want to make this separate. So when for regulation, if you're choosing your own adventure, um, so there's a link to different adventures, but along the way, you could be saying, you know, making those decisions, how are they respectful? Debriefing, how are you responsible during that choose your adventure activity? So do you see how you can be tying in the opportunity to build their self, their a way to deal with others and the idea to make decisions those are the sel components and still align with your work with pbis so these were just some examples i'm not going to go through them my favorite of course is you always need to name it to tame it and if you haven't heard that work um, or the phrase or the work that has been done the whole idea is that we can't get to regulating if we really don't know what it is and going back to those self-checks are really the beginning of that um, 
and we all know about breathing techniques. It's like that's almost seems to be our go to, but there's far other things that we can be putting in that resiliency toolkit for our kids. My personal one is the mood meter app. So if you aren't uh, aware of that, I think it's 99 cents from the App Store and it's by the uh, Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. I actually use this, but you can use it with your kids and it gives you so many opportunities to um, look at an X and Y axis on your energy level versus your um, pleasantness and how you're feeling. And it puts you into different um, quadrants, as you can see, red, yellow, blue, or green. And then it gives you some strategies if you wanna move into another quadrant. It's a very cool, it's got lots of great things. So that's on there too, on the handout where you can find it. And yes, it's from Dr. Mark Brackett's work. I'm reading your chats too, yes. Um, so he's an amazing guy too. So Barb, it's the next one. Right, and so the very last thing, we want our kids to be global citizens, make good decisions, right? So how do we build cooperation? Um, and these are just some great examples of how kids can work together and problem solve. Um, if you're not familiar with problem solving kids, the opportunity is to teach kids some different sequence strategies that they can use to problem solve and then have the kit available so that kids don't come up to you all the time for you to solve their problems so that they can become their independent problem solvers um, even in developmentally you can do this from um, you know early childhood all the way to high school it just would look differently and kids could come up with scenarios on what they could do to solve problems so I think with that, I'm going to have Barb turn the page. Our time, it is almost at the very end. Again, we try to take the transcripts and just pull out the strategies so that you are your own community of practice for SEL and PBS right now. If there's anything you would like to add, some um, great ideas that we can take back to our virtual classroom or to our regular new classroom, what that might look like in the fall. What are some things you're doing um, that you would like to add? Please type that in. And with that, we're gonna do a little closure. So add to the chat box if you have any great ideas. Handout link is on the, that's one of the questions. It, I'm going to send a chat right now on the chat box. We're going to look at the links that we're going to talk about. And the very last link is where you can find the webinar resources. Okay. So let me go with this. As we start to go through the slides to wind ourselves down here in the next three minutes, be sure to keep adding into that chat box things that you're doing in your SEL competencies because we've really learned a lot from each other um, during these times. We're being super creative getting through this time. So keep adding those in the chat box. We will be um, adding a copy of the chat into our folder as well. So you'll have access to that chat box. I always like to add that, remember, stressed spelled backwards is dessert. So, you know, lots of good desserts out there. So stress has, has its positive. So we'd like to have you, I'm sorry, Krista, I just cut you off. We'd like to have you share your thoughts, give us an evaluation. There's a link in the chat box about where the evaluations are. Know that this is the last of the daily uh, webinars being um, hosted by the CPC. And we are going to be moving back to now going to your local TA centers for your trainings. And we just reminded you at the beginning, these weren't trainings. They were really about getting you as many resources as possible um, to get through this time as we start to transition somewhat back to school as well. Uh, we are still going forward with the conference. I'm not sure. I think there's another meeting next week to decide whether or not this is going to be a virtual conference or if it's going to be live. Um, so keep your eyes open. Keep looking at the CPC website, the California PBIS Coalition, for any updates on that. We will also be um, changing up our recognition system this year just based on current events and what's been happening. So we'll resume it next year, but what we are doing is the CPC Community Cares. If you're not aware of that, um, it's really just sending in a narrative on the great work that you're doing about positive safe school climate, 
Um, there's no criteria. Um, it's just really celebrating your work right now. So um, I think the deadline is June 30th. And if you have questions about it, you can read all about it on um, the website pbisca.org and go to recognition system. But also you can go back to the resource link because there was a webinar on it and they recorded that webinar. And third, you can talk to your TA center that you've been training with. They should have information for you too. In closing, Christy and I certainly want to thank you for your attendance today. This was a repeat, so we um, have another uh, recording of this that was earlier in the month. Um, if you want to look at that recording or this one as well. Uh, like I said, we will be posting what came up in the chats in that same folder where you can download the materials as well as a PowerPoint. If you have any um, requests for the PowerPoint itself, because we have to put them up on the website as a PDF, either e email Christy or myself, and you can see our address is there on the bottom of this slide, and we can send you the PowerPoint itself if you'd like to have it. Um, we do have notes on the bottom of each of those uh, for the things that we said during that time with you, so they might be beneficial. Just email us and let us know. Christy, you want to add anything to our goodbye? Oh, I... I just always want to acknowledge all of us. Um, we, we are all amazing and going through this challenge, um, I think we have really shown our perseverance and our um, belief that we can make it happen for our kids. And so with all of these challenges, thank you so much for really making the difference with our kids right now. They appreciate it. They need it. Thank you.